want you to go back to that section of the flow chart because what we're going to do is we're going to go to the long bone description, okay? And we're going to go to the flat bone description, okay? This is where we're going to plug in the, uh, the manufacturer of bone, okay? If you look in your book, on page, um, it says, I not got his book out. I really wish they would get my computer hooked up. So, we could use Blackboard Science. Uh, take a look on page um, eight, uh, 184, I think. Oh, three. Okay. 182 and 183. 182 and 183. Okay. On page 182, I want you to look at uh, figure 6.8. Okay, that's telling you one way to make bone. And on page 183, I want you to look at figure 6.9. That's telling you the other way. Okay, so here we go. Under your flow chart where you had identifying, you know, so you had a long bone, you had a flat bone, you had a short bone, you had a regular bone. Under that long bone, this is where we're going to plug in one of the types of ossification or bone making. Okay. This is where we're going to put endochondral ossification. Okay. This is where we're going to put that. Because more often than not, you see it in long bone. Endochondral ossification, that's what they're showing you on page 183. What does that bone look like if you look in step number one? Yeah, I know it's really small, but it kind of looks like a baby humerus, doesn't it? Well, we know a humerus will be a long bone. Endochondral ossification is in long bone. Alright, so let me ask you this question. In the two divisions of the skeleton, axial and appendicular, which division would you see endochondral ossification? Appendicular. Appendicular. Long bones. Appendicular. Long bones. Okay. Now, look at the one on the page before that. It says intramembranous. Intramembranous is usually how you make flat bones. Now, I had another question yesterday, and it was a good question. Um, do flat bones always have to be straight? No. They have to be flat. So, you saw an example of a flat bone yesterday when we did the skull. That was the cranium. As a matter of fact, I showed you that cross section of the cranium. That cross section, you're going to see if you're on page 182, go all the way down to uh, uh, figure 4 there, the bottommost figure on that first column of 182. You looked at that yesterday. That is the sandwich that you saw in the cross section of the skull that I showed you. I blew it up on there. So, Flat bones do not always have to be straight. They can be curved.
but they have to be flat. Okay. So where else would you see a flat bone? Uh, yeah, I already got the sternum and we already have the, the curved part of the, of the uh, skull. Where else do you think you'd see a flat bone? Uh, ribs and uh, ribs are actually the curve. They're, they're the hip, yes. The uh, if you all play Simon Says and Simon Says put your hands on your hips, what you're putting your hand on, you will see will be one part of the hip called the ilium. That is a wide, flat bone. A wide, flat bone. Okay, so intramembranous and endochondral. Now, we're going to do the easy one first. Intramembranous is the easy one. Now, you look at your book, and again, I wish we had the PowerPoint slides, but we'll have to uh, punt here and do with what we have. Look at number one. Okay. Uh, that's up here. This is where we're starting. Okay, we're going to be starting with uh, number one. So what we can do is we can just put some little numbers here that will match what we've got. Now, you look at this thing and you see ossification center appears in the fibrous connective tissue membrane. Selected centrally located mesenchymal cells cluster and differentiate in osteoblasts forming an ossification center. That must have been paid by the word here. Um, and it's certainly going to carry away. We're going to simplify that. We're going to say, for step number one, we're going to say osteoblasts. Well, you know what an osteoblast is. Osteoblasts form ossification centers. Well, what does that mean? It means, look what they're showing you in number one. It's like in a cowboy movie. Okay, they're circling the wagons. All of these are going to be your osteoblasts. And together, this whole clump, look, they put it in this bracket. This whole clump is going to be an ossification center. Okay. Now, before I even go any farther, and if I haven't mentioned it, let me mention the fundamental rule about making bone. What are we always going to change into bone? I'll give you a hint. You studied it in connective tissue. There were three different types. And one of them you always see at the end of a chicken leg. Cartilage. I don't care which one of these. Okay? But you will, the fundamental rule is you always are going to convert cartilage to bone. That's the fundamental rule. It's just how we go about it. Okay? How do we go? Well, we go about a different way in intramembranous than we do in endocrine. But the fundamental rule is we convert cartilage to bone. Okay, so instead of all that gobbledygook there for number one, we've shortened it. Because remember, we're trying to organize information and get it so that we can simplify it and understand what's going on. Let's look at number two. Number two. Uh, number two, bone matrix is secreted within fibrous membrane and calcifies. Osteoblasts begin to secrete osteoid, which is calcified within a few days. Trapped osteoblasts become osteocytes. Wow, boy, if they didn't get paid enough with the first one, they got paid more with the second. We're going to make that simple. Number two, we're going to say that Um, I do this different every time I do this class, uh, so i got to remember how I did this. Uh, okay. Here we go. Os 
osteoblasts make, well, we know they make bone, right? So all I'm going to say is osteoblasts make bone matrix. Osteoblasts make bone matrix. Okay, and what do we call the osteoblasts that get trapped inside the osteon and they go to a resting state? They're called osteocytes. Osteoblasts make bone matrix and become osteocytes. Here we go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You can see if I was an editor, I'd right? never make a living. <laughs> All right. Number, that's number two. Number three. Look at number three. I am going to have to probably move my endochondral ossification down. A little bit. <laughs> I know. You're all going to say, no, I need more room. All right, number three. Let's look at number three. Woven bone and periosteum form. Accumulating osteoids laid down between embryonic blood vessels in a random manner results in a network instead of lamella of trabeculae called woven bone. Vascularized mesenchyme condenses on the external face of the woven bone and becomes a periosteum. You could buy a car with that uh, description if they were paying by the word hmm. on there. All right, we're going to make this much simpler. Okay. For number three, we are going to say that um, here's what we'll say. For number three, we're going to say formation of trabeculae. Okay, so as soon as I put that in, you know what kind of bone this is going to be. Compact or spongy? Spongy. 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 Formation of trabeculae occurs, comma, periosteum forms. Period. Took all that and I boiled it down. I had a, uh, my doctoral uh, advisor kept hitting me over the head saying, if you can't say it in 250 words, it's not worth saying. So that's why I got really good at throwing words out. Whether the sentence made sense, that's another thing. Four, last step. Okay, here's the last step for intramembranous ossification. Lamellar bone replaces woven bone just deep to periosteum. Red marrow appears. Trabeculae just deep to periosteum thicken and are later replaced with mature lamellar bone forming compact bone plates. Spongy bone consisting of distinct trabeculae persists internally and vascular tissue becomes red marrow. They could buy another car with that. All right, last step. And here's what we're going to say. We're going to say that, um, remember the cross section I showed you with the skull? Okay. We're going to say um, final. Bone ossification. Final bone ossification. So I'm trying to impress on you, this is it. After four, we're done. Okay. Final bone ossification results in two outside layers of compact bone. Remember the 
I mentioned they were like slices of bread. Ooh. When I showed you that cross section, that's what I mean. Uh, but two outside layers, compact bone. Surrounding um, internal or inside the two layers. Whatever word you want to put in there, inside or internal. Internal layer of spongy bone. And in parentheses, I'm going to put red marrow. Now, I don't have to put trabeculae in there. You know trabeculae are in there because I said a internal layer of spongy bone. What makes up spongy bone trabeculae? What do you find inside those holes of trabecula? Marrow. Flat bones contain almost exclusively red marrow. So if you have to donate bone marrow, okay, the old-fashioned way, incidentally, they're not doing that anymore. It's, uh, it, it really is very painless now uh, to donate bone marrow. But the old-fashioned way, remember I told you about that wide bone in the hip that you put your hand on, okay? That is loaded with red marrow. So they would go in and they would uh, have this very long needle on people think it looked like a harpoon on there, attached to a 50 cc needle, okay? They'd insert it into the bone and then they'd pull up some bone marrow. And red bone marrow looks like, if you've ever had a red slushy, that's what red bone marrow looks like. Almost, it looks exactly like that. Okay. Kind of thick, but not, you know, uh, more viscous. And uh, they pull up about 50 cc's, and then they'll go and they'll inject that into the recipient. And in the recipient, all they'll do is they'll inject it in an IV line. And those bone marrow cells will find their way. Even though you injected them in an IV line, they will find their way to the actual bone marrow. The person that, uh, that donates that, is that reproducible? For, for the donator? Is that reproducible? Oh, is he going to get that back? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It'll be replaced. Yeah, it'll be replaced. Nowadays, what they do is, they don't even do that. What they'll do is, they will do a procedure that's almost like you giving blood. Okay? They will remove a certain amount of blood in a bag, and then they will remove the stem cells, the marrow cells, from that collection. And then they will inject that into the recipient. So you don't have to endure that painful, and it is painful to penetrate the bone. Right. Because what is in the bone that will give you the sensation of pain? Nerves. Nerves. Everybody thinks there's nothing in the bone. I mean, no, you have lots of stuff in the bone. Okay, so there you are, flat bones. We have basically taken all of those terms and we have reduced it into something that we can very easily comprehend. We know that intramembranous ossification is one way to change cartilage to bone. We see it in flat bones. We see it where it's going to give us ultimately a sandwich. One slice of bread is one layer of compact bone. One slice of bread is another layer of compact bone in between spongy bone. And that spongy bone will contain red marrow. And our steps are listed right there. Step number one, ossification center. We have osteoblasts forming ossification center. Step two, osteoblasts make bone matrix. You know what a bone matrix is. What will I find in bone matrix? What key element that is stored in bone? that we lose when you have osteoporosis. Calcium. 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 That's in the bone matrix. That's basically what makes up the bone matrix. 
Uh, and those cells that are trapped, those osteoblasts that are trapped in the bone matrix, they become osteocytes. Three, formation of trabeculae occurs, periosteum forms. So you know something is going on inside as well as outside. And then four, final bone ossification results in two outside layers of compact bone. Sometimes I can't even read my own writing. Surrounding. Internal layer of spongy bone. I used to drive our legal secretary crazy. Okay. okay, that's it. That's intramembranous ossification. All right. Now, what can we say about the other one? Endochondral ossification. All right. Well, endochondral is a little bit different. We're going to work our way across. Okay. So, number one, you look at this really teeny tiny little, you know, as I said, I think this is going to be humorous uh, when it grows up. This is what you're seeing in the fetus, okay, shortly after conception, all right, when the skeleton starts to be laid down. The first thing that is different about endochondral ossification, uh, yeah, endo. The first thing that is different is that for, for endochondral ossification, you are using a template or a model of the ultimate shape of the bone. Look at number one. Yeah, I know it looks more like a dumbbell, okay, but think about what a humerus looks like. And you've seen it enough, I know we haven't looked at it in detail, but you've seen enough. You know that there's going to be a bulge at one end, which is the proximal epiphysis. There's going to be a bulge at the other end, which is the distal epiphysis, and you're going to have a diaphysis in between. Well, yeah. So, endochondral ossification, we are going to ossify a cartilage template. All right, now when I talk about the word template, all I mean is it's shaped like the final product. Okay? It's mm -hmm. shaped like the final product. So you look here, this is going to ultimately turn into humerus. That's what I mean by template. You're just basically following the outline. Okay. All right. So let's start with uh, number one. It says bone collar forms around hyaline cartilage model. Well, okay. I already told you about the hyaline cartilage model. Okay. I said that's your template. All right. So. Let me just put one other thing in, because I don't want to use a different set of numbers than what we have here, so I'm just going to add this on. We're going to ossify cartilage template. And number one is, the very first thing we're going to see is the um, formation of bony collar. Okay. Where is that? Right in the middle. It's going to be right in the middle. There's the bony collar. Because we're going to ultimately be starting here. Okay, with the actual ossification. Now, your author jumped the gun here a little bit. And they went ahead and they put primary ossification center in with step number one. I think they were just trying to conserve uh, space on there. Uh, for number two, okay, look at what we got for number two. Cartilage in the center of diaphysis calcifies hmm. and then develops cavities. Okay, well, here's where I'm going to put that primary ossification. Primary ossification center starts 
to form medullary cavity. Okay, well, we know where the medullary cavity is. Now, let's just stop and think here. Did you look back on your flow chart? We had regions and we had parts. Regions always end in epsis. Parts were on the right side. <clears throat> medullary cavity was a part. That's found in the diaphysis. Look where this is occurring. In the diaphysis, we're making the medullary cavity. And look how it's expanding. Where is it headed? It's headed towards the ends. This is the direction it's going. It's going up this way, it's going down that way. <coughs> okay, let's look at number three. <coughs> number three. <coughs> Number three, periosteal body invades internal cavity and spongy bone begins to form. All right, now hopefully you see the reason why I inflicted parts and regions on you. Remember how the parts went? Periosteum, compact bone, spongy bone, endosteum, marrow, and the medullary cavity. Number three. It says, spongy bone begins to form. So we're going to have spongy bone um, begins to line medullary cavity. Remember, it is going to be covered by that endosteum, but I'm trying to get you to, to remember how these things are going here. Because what are we going to find in the holes of that spongy bone? Marrow. Yeah. And what kind of marrow do we find in the diaphysis? Red or yellow? Yellow. Yellow. So spongy bone begins to line the biliary cavity, and... I'll put a semicolon. Uh, and blood vessels begin to enter bone. Matter of fact, let's say blood vessels begin to enter at diaphysis. There we go. So we know where we're at. We're right in the middle. That's three. You look at that and you see spongy bone begins to line the medullary cavity. Yep, sure enough. Blood vessels begin to enter at diaphysis. Yep. Okay, let's look at four. Four. Diaphysis elongates and a medullary cavity forms as ossification center continues. Okay, well that's great. The next sentence is the important one. Secondary ossification center appears in the epiphysis in preparation for stage 5. That second sentence occurs only, 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 only in endochondral ossification. So that's what I'm going to start with. I'm going to start by saying secondary ossification centers occur, or I'm sorry, um, begin to form at epiphysis. Both one, okay? Uh, proximal and distal. So now you've got a race. You've got a race. Remember what's happening with the primary ossification center. It's headed up in that direction, and it's headed down in that direction. Well, now you've launched a second front. Now you've launched a secondary ossification center. And that secondary ossification center is going to start heading in that direction, 
and the primary is going to start continue to head in this direction. At some point, they're going to meet. And at some point, the bone will become completely ossified. Okay, the bone will become completely ossified. You go to stage five. Stage five, look what they have right there, childhood to adolescence. Look how this has progressed. I mean, this looks like a finished product, okay? Look how this has grown. Except there's one piece of cartilage left. And it's right there. Epiphyseal plate cartilage. Step number five. We're going to say... Step number five... Uh, ossification continues. So what does that mean? That means primary continues working, secondary continues working. Ossification continues to leave only a epiphyseal plate. of cartilage. Now, I wrote it this way because as long as you see these two words, epiphyseal plate, you still have a chance to grow. As long as there still is cartilage there, the bone has not completely ossified and it still has a chance to elongate. Look, you start at number one, at the far left side, go all the way over to the far right. What is one thing you can say about the length as you go from left to right? It gets longer, right? Well, that's what's happening as the child grows. The bone is getting longer. All right, the bone is getting longer. When you get to 22, 23, what happens is the race is over. You have the bone completely ossified, and now when all the cartilage is gone, you have something that is called epiphyseal line. I'm going to put in parentheses here. No cartilage left growth done. If you get to the stage and you're only 5'2 and you want to have a career in the NBA, think about accounting. You're done growing, okay? So how does that happen? How does it occur? It occurs if you turn the page, and this is where we will, uh, we will end here. If you turn the page, look at this figure right here. Okay? Look at this figure right here. Let me kind of blow it up here. This is showing you different zones. Okay? This is showing you different zones uh, of uh, cartilage and what is going on in terms of the active uh, uh, ossification. I want you, when you look at this, I want you to write up here. Uh, and I know they're trying to show you the, the location by this square. They're trying to say, hey, look, here's the square right here. We blew it up. But for orientation, right up here, the, wor the words, towards joint, okay, towards joint. So you know that we're headed up in this direction. As I go up this way, look, this arrow is going up, it says resting zone. You know that's headed up towards the joint, towards the surface of the bone that makes the joint, okay. All right, look at these cells here. All right. I want you to st look at these zones. They're marked in numbers 1, 2, 3, 4. Just look at number 1. 
Number one goes from here to here. Okay? So number one ends right there. Each one of these you've already seen before. What do we call the space? That can, yeah, I didn't even get to the end. Yeah, a lacunae. That contains what type of cell that makes cartilage? Chondrocyte. Chondrocyte. You're looking at them all. You're looking at spaces, a lacunae, and inside those dark shapes are chondrocytes. Look how they are stacked up like poker chips or, or stacks of pennies. You know, they're all stacked up one on top of another. That is the characteristic of the proliferation zone. There is the reason why they're stacked up, and here's the reason right here, this last word, mitosis. That's why this has the word proliferation. Cells are rapidly growing, okay? Cells are rapidly growing. So they're all stacking up one on top of another. So they're all actively growing. Okay, let's go down to here. Number two. Now, what does that mean? If I'm going in this direction, am I moving towards the joint or away? Away. Yeah, what did I have you right up there? Towards the joint. So, let me ask you this. If I'm moving in this direction, am I moving towards the diaphysis or away from the diaphysis? Towards the diaphysis. Okay, so I'm headed towards the enemy. I'm headed towards the bone cells who are marching up trying to turn cartilage in the, into bone. All right, we've had zone one. All the cells are stacking up because they're multiplying like crazy. Number two. All right, number two goes from here to here. All right, they're still stacked. But what can you say about the shape? And they already gave you a hand here with this word. They're, they're getting fatter. Hypertrophic. Anything that's hypertrophic is enlarged. Okay? So in zone two, these cartilage cells. And where did these cartilage cells come from? From zone that ended up in zone two? Where do you think they came from? Yeah, they got pushed out. This stuff is growing like crazy, and we got to have room, so you're out of here. You're going down to zone two. What does that sound like? Where have we seen where things are growing at one level, and then they're pushing up and outward? The skin. The skin. Yeah, this is the same idea. When the body finds something that works, it tries to repeat and use it elsewhere. Okay, so now we have fat cells that are headed towards the battlefield, that are headed towards meeting the osteoblasts. And here we go. Here is the battle. Zone three. Zone three, these fat, hypertrophic, cartilage cells throw themselves at the osteoblast and they lose. Time and time again they throw and they lose. Okay. Calcification zone. Those cartilage cells are being turned into bone. Calcification zone. Matrix becomes calcified. And finally, number four, you have final deposition of the actual bone. Now, you're going to say, all right, well, how can the bone keep growing? And here is the key. The speed of how fast the osteoblasts are moving up matches the speed of mitosis in zone one. As long as the speeds are the same, zone one always stays ahead 
I'll be honest with you, Mark. Just think about that. If I have the speed, the osteoblasts are going this fast, well, for the bone to keep growing, that zone one has to grow the same rate, this fast. And as a result, as long as the speeds are the same, the length grows. until you get to 21 or 22, and then what happens is the speed in zone one slows down, and the osteoblast catch up, and you lose the last bit of cartilage. That's how bones grow in length the entire life. Bones grow in length up to the point where the epiphyseal plate is uh, gone. Bones grow in width the entire length. Okay, we went a little longer on our thing here. Let's go ahead, let's take our break. Um, let's take, really, you know, you don't see that much in there, okay? But right here, there is the lesser wing. And on the floor, there is the greater wing. Okay, the greater wing. Lesser wing. And of course, there'd be one on this side, but you see it's been all chopped away. Okay. So, lesser wing, and then the greater wing. And looks like a butterfly. All right, the cella tersica, if you look right here, um, and again, this has all been, I, I mean, it looks like somebody attacked this with an ice pick. Um, but uh, right in here, you'd see a little indentation. You could actually probably put your uh, pinky and have it fit right in this indentation, right in here. Okay? This, this has all been chipped away. Um, so in real life, it would be up where my pencil tip is. It's all been chipped away on this one. But if you look, there's the lesser wing, and then you look right in here, you're going to see a little indentation. Okay? You can almost maybe fit your, uh, your uh, little pinky uh, in there. That indentation, and you see, this is what they're trying to show you right here. Okay? There's the lesser wing, and then right here is this little indentation. You probably can fit your, your pinky in there. That is the cella tersica. Why is that important? Well, what you're going to find when we do the brain, located right here, is the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland is the master gland of the body. It controls all hormones. If you have a problem with the pituitary gland, you have to have surgery, they're not going to take the top of your skull off and then reach in and kind of pull the brain up. Because, because this is at the bottom of the brain. It sticks out on a little stalk. No, what they're going to do is they're going to go up through the nose. The nose is right behind this floor. They're going to go up through the nose, break the bone in the nose, and then break through this cella tersica and the pituitary is right there. And then they'll do whatever surgery is needed. If any of you have seen uh, the movie, uh, the original, I understand they, they, they're doing a remake now. The original one, a, a total recall with Arnold Schwarzenegger. Um, you know, he had this tracking chip and he had to do this, uh, uh, this uh, operation up through the nose to get the chip out of the brain chip was in the pituitary gland. And actually, that's how they would remove something from the pituitary gland, up through the nose. In fact, the Egyptians, when they were embalming, they would remove the entire brain through the nose. Okay. That's a pretty good feat when you think about it. Okay. 
I guess it wouldn't be a feet. Uh, you would be using your head. <laughs> Solitarsica. All right. Now, it got the name because, think about this was in the 16th, 17th century. People were riding horses. As it turns out, Sella Tersica, okay, is Latin for Turk's Saddle. It turns out, if you look at this area right here from the side, it almost looks like a saddle. And evidently, it was a type of saddle that Turkish riders favored, I guess. <coughs> so they named it. Sela Tersica, Turk Saddle, on there, and that's where the pituitary gland is located. Okay, so that's our Sela Tersica. We did the greater and lesser wings. Now, go back to your lesser wing. If you look right where the Sela Tersica is, just come up diagonally, and you're going to see a little hole. That is the optic, again, your book uses canal, technically that should be a foramen. Okay, and I think, I can't remember what I used, I used kind of, yeah, I used foramen, put on there. Optic foramen, optic canal, either one will work for you, okay? Optic canal, right there. This is going to be where the optic nerve from the right eye comes into the brain. This is where the left optic nerve comes into the brain, okay? Do not try and use the uh, fissures in the back. So let me see, I can't show you because that one is all chewed up. So, there is your cella tersica right there. I can almost put my little pinky in there. Okay. Here is the lesser wing. Kind of looks like a bat. Right here. If I rotate this, you're going to see an opening, a foramen, that is going to be where the optic nerve comes in. Okay. Do not try and go into this slit in the back here where my pencil is, okay? This craggly looking slit. That actually is your next one where you see superior orbital fissure. That is the pencil right there is in the superior orbital fissure, okay? The superior orbital fissure, I can get light down into there. There it is back there, that craggly little slit-like opening. Look what's right next to it. There, right there, there's the optic foramen, right there. So don't try and send the optic nerve through the, um, the uh, superior orbital fissure. That has nothing to do with allowing, allow, oh, you know, uh, to give you an idea, I just noticed on this one. And this one actually looks like one line. Um, that looks like my writing. To give you an idea what the practical would look like. Some of the skulls may still have tags on them. Okay. So you see, like for example, there is a sticker, and it's number eleven. So it would be dealing with a question on number eleven. 
I have no idea what that question would be. This isn't it. I have no idea what 11 would be asking for, except for the front of um, Over here, look at number 10. No, this isn't mine. That isn't my handwriting. Look at number 10. Number 10 is pointing, but I do the same sort of thing. Number 10 is pointing to that opening. Well, this is the petrius portion. That opening would be your internal auditory medius. That's how the labels will be on the, on the practical. It'll be something like that. Okay, so um, that should take care. Oh, we got to do one other thing. And the very last thing there, it says, um, <laughs> and fortunately it's bad in this bill. Uh, it says pteroid processes. It's actually missing, missing a G uh, on there. Let me blow this up a little bit and get more light back on it. This actually should be pterygoid uh, process. If you um, just flip one page back, okay, to page 205. Okay. One page back, page 205. All right, you're looking at the underneath of the of the skull. Okay. If you look, uh, huh. well, they're both right there, but they don't have a mark. Okay. You look in the underneath, okay? Look at if your skull is fortunate enough that you have, it's not like mine, where I have no teeth left in the upper part of the jaw here. But if you go to where the teeth end, so basically kind of right where my two fingers are, you're going to see this curved uh, process here, okay? It almost looks like it could be a scoop. And there's one on each side, okay? And it is kind of sharp. The edges may be kind of sharp on there, all right? Well, what that is, is that is the pterygoid process. And what you need to do is you need to end up putting where you have a uh, uh, P-T-E-R. You need to put a G right here, okay? Uh, the P is silent, so you just say pterygoid. Uh, I'm sorry, put the G after the Y. I'm sorry, put the G after the Y. Talk when you have bifocals here. Put the G after the Y. Pterygoid process. So you've got to put a G there. But those are going to be the sharp processes here. Okay? And what happens is tongues for the muscle end up attaching to that uh, pterygoid process. Alright, that's the uh, sphenoid bone, the last major bone of the skull, and then we have facial bones. Uh, the last major bone of the skull is going to be the ethmoid bone, okay? Now, right here, again, I want you to, to make a note for yourself. But make a note for yourself and write in here in parentheses, write um, look at uh, inside what did I have you write here before? Look at oh look at floor of skull. Do the same thing here. Look at floor of skull. Write it in here next to the F1 bone. Look at floor of skull. Okay? So you're gonna be looking down into the skull. So what you're going to be doing is you're going to be having a picture like this. All right. Now, you look up here in the frontal bone. Okay. You look up here in the frontal bone. Oh, that's probably what they were looking for. They were looking at one of the fossas. Yeah, that wasn't me. I don't have that on my sheet. All right. Well, anyway, here's the frontal bone. Okay. Right here in the middle. 
You're going to look at this. It's a little structure on the diagram here. It kind of looks like an arrowhead, a skinny arrowhead. That is the ethmoid bone. Okay? That is the ethmoid bone. Now, on mine, again, it's all been like attacked with an ice pick, but it would be right here where my finger is. Okay? And this is the frontal bone here. Okay? There's the frontal bone. So I'm looking down onto the floor, okay, the inside of the frontal bone, and you look right in here and you'll see uh, a, a bone that has a raised central ridge. There's, there's a little ridge that sticks out right in the middle of it. Your finger can run across it. Okay? Actually, that is the thing that's still kind of intact. You see my finger is going over it. Okay? That's the very center of the ethmoid bone. Okay? And if you look, your, um, your sheet has didn't get everything in here. Your sheet has, uh, the first thing it has is the cribriform plate, okay, uh, for your, uh, there we are right there, the ethmoid bone. First thing is there is a cribriform plate. Well, I want to actually go down here to three. This object right here that's called the Christogaly, remember I said that central raised ridge that you can feel, it may not be that prominent in the plastic ones, but you can kind of feel a little bit of a spine or a ridge there. If you run your finger. That is the Krista Galley. Okay? That is the Krista Galley. That is the dead center of the arrowhead. Okay? So the, uh, the ethmoid bone is going to look kind of like this. Okay? And right down the center is going to be the Christogaly. Okay. Think of it as like the spine of the arrowhead. Now, I had on the beginning there where it said the cribriform plate. The cribriform plate, if we're sticking with the analogy of this like an arrowhead, okay, right here, the wing that radiate out from the spine. This area right here that looks like the wings of the arrowhead. Each one on each side is a cribriform plate. The ridge is the Christogaly. The wings of the arrow are the cribriform plate. Some of your uh, models, you can actually see, uh, because the mold was pretty good, you can see like little holes in the cribriform plate. Those holes are the olfactory foramen. Cranial nerve number one is the olfactory nerve. It comes right out underneath the frontal lobe of the brain. So that main cranial nerve is lying right here. And what it's doing is, it's then sending little nerves, little nerve endings, down through these holes. And on the other side of this is the roof of the nose. And there is where you're going to get your sense of smell. Okay. It's going to be on that uh, other side where those nerves are coming out of the olfactory foramen. Now, you'll learn in the respiratory section that there are three chambers to the nose. They're called concha. Uh, I'll point them out to you here. They're at the very end of the skull. Um, they look like little uh, shelves inside the nasal cavity. They direct the flow of air through the nose, okay? And you'll learn about how the nose works to humidify, warm air, remove dirt, all those sorts of things. But in terms of the sense of smell, when you are normally breathing through your nose, 
you are actually activating less than 10% of these nerves going through these olfactory foramina. The airflow is basically missing all of these nerves. How do we end up getting the sense of smell? What is the very first thing you do when somebody turns to you and says, do you smell that? I smell gas. Do you smell that? What do you do? You sniff. When you sniff, you change the flow of direction of the air. And now it maximally hits all of these nerves. And you get maximal stimulation. Okay. Anytime, if you have a dog, when I used to um, have my Goldens, you know, we'd go out for a walk, it would take like an hour and a half to do a walk, because they'd always have their nose down to the ground, and what would they be doing? They'd be going... Well, a dog has tenfold greater sense of smell than we do. We can distinguish about 10,000 different scents. A dog can differentiate over 100,000. That's why you bump into them at O'Hare. Okay? And they sniff your suitcase. Um, and the reason for that, think about what a dog's nose is. It's usually very long. So there's lots of room for that scent to you know, bounce around. And then if you ever watch when they get interested in something, they're going to sniff. Their nose is going to be very close to the ground and you're going to hear them do a short exhale through the nose. And then they'll sniff again. What they're doing is they're sending a little bit of airflow down onto the ground where the scent is. Getting that those molecules of odor up and then they sniff them immediately back up. And that's how they get that, you know, great sense of, uh, of smell. And then it is physiologically and anatomically true that a woman's sense of smell is better than a male's. On a man. Sorry, guys. Um, Somehow, physiologically, a woman can distinguish more different types of scents, and they can also distinguish concentration better than males. I always use that excuse when my wife says, don't you smell that garbage? That garbage has to go out. And I always say, what garbage? I don't smell any garbage. On there. And then I always say, of course you know that a male has a lesser sense of smell than a female does. Is that because less of those nerves are activated for men? We don't know. Really? We don't know what it is. Because it, like, it really is true. But if you, do, if you do a clinical test and you have uh, you know, men versus women and you have them blindfolded and you have them smell different things at different concentrations, women will always pick it off better. Uh, it could, it could. Um, then we secrete hormones from our armpits and stuff, right? Like, that's probably why they smell that. Like, maybe that's why. Oh, you're thinking of pheromones? Yeah, like pheromones. Like yeah. Pheromones and stuff yeah. Like that. Uh, pheromones are a very controversial thing. Uh, th there's an argument going on as to whether we really do secrete pheromones or not. Uh, and it's up for grabs. Uh, but it's an interesting thing. It could be. It'd be a good research process. Okay, uh, so those are the the uh, Krista Galley, river form plate, and the olfactory foramen. All right, now perpendicular plate. What I want you to do is, I want you to take the skull, and I want you to look at anteriorly and look up the nose. Okay. And of course, mine it, it is all totally like chipped away. You can see like the hole right into the floor of the skull. But if you look through the nose, okay, what you're going to see is you're going to see 
uh, a divider, okay, you're going to see the wall that separates the two nostrils. And if this is like the, the opening of the, of the nose, okay, that you're looking up, you're going to see a bone coming up from the floor of the nose, and then you look at the very top, you're going to see a bone coming down from the top of the nose. Together, these two eventually form to make the division between the two nostrils. Okay? This one that comes down from the top is your perpendicular plate. The top part of the septum, and you will hear about patients that have deviated septums, and it's hard for them to breathe on one nostril versus the other, and they may have, or sometimes what may happen is they broke the nose, the nose didn't heal correctly, so they go back and re-break it and reposition. The top portion that divides the two nostrils belongs to the ethmoid bone, that's the perpendicular plate. If you look at the very bottom, this one here, okay, if you look at your study guide, at the very bottom of the study guide, uh, right down towards here, you see the word vomer. That bottom bone that helps make that division, okay, that's the vomer bone. So those two bones help put together the, um, the uh, uh, wall that divides the nostrils. Okay, now, I'm not going to, as I said, here we have the superior, the inferior, and the middle nasal concha. I mentioned about those. Um, you're actually going to look at these in detail in the respiratory chapter. So, again, these are like shelves in the nasal cavity that will distribute airflow. If you take a look on Uh, yeah, I was I was hoping for one where they have the cross section, but you know what? Let me let me show you so you'll know the model when it comes up next semester. This is the model that has the. Uh, nasal concha. Let me just show it to you. Uh, I will not use this, okay? This will not be on your practical, but I want to show you uh, where uh, these are. Here's the nasal cavity, okay? There are these shells. So there's the superior, there's the middle, and there's the inferior. You can see how ordinarily Airflow will just kind of go right between the middle and the inferior one. But when you do that sniffing, you know, that airflow is going to be redirected up to that superior nasal concha. Okay. So this is the one that you'll run into next semester uh, on there. So uh, I'm not going to have you, because of the... Uh, uh, the shape of these uh, skulls, they're not very good at showing those. So I'm not going to have you be responsible for those. I showed you where they are. You'll come back to really study them in more detail in the respiratory unit. So if you want, you can uh, line those out. And you can line out uh, the lateral masses because I have to break the skull open to, uh, to show you the lateral masses. Uh, let me just introduce one thing, and that's the nasal bone. Okay. Now, all of these are considered facial bones. Why? Because they basically are in this region, running from underneath the frontal bone down to the jaw. OK? 
Okay, so anatomists lump this because they consider this is the face. All of these bones in this region as facial bones. Okay, two bones, and then uh, I'm going to run down and get the uh, uh, exam. The two bones, the nasal bones. All you have to worry about are the nasal bones, their location. And any of you who are either blessed or cursed with wearing glasses know exactly where the nasal bone is. That's the bridge of your nose. Okay, that's where your nasal bones are. This is not a nasal bone. Okay, this is part of it. That moves back and forth. The nasal bones, the one on each side, is where the glasses ordinarily would rest, you know, on, uh, on a person. Okay. And that's all you need to worry about for nasal bone. Okay, we will uh, finish off the, uh, the rest of these go pretty quickly, and then the vertebral column goes pretty fast. Uh, the skull, by far and away, as you probably are getting the feeling for, is the most intricate. And it's the slowest in terms of doing things. Okay, give me uh, one sec here and I'll go down.